So in the previous notebook, we inspected the XOR dataset and coded a multilayer perceptron in PyTorch. Let's now finally train this multilayer perceptron to see how it performs on this dataset. Let's get started. So first we need all the previous cells that we had in the previous notebook. So let's get to the bottom of this. We stopped in the previous video talking about the data loader. And now we are interested in training the multilayer perceptron that we defined above using that data loader or the multiple data loaders, the training, validation, and the test loader. So let's implement the training loop now. So first, before we implement the actual training loop, let's define a little utility function, the compute accuracy function here. Later on, we will see how we can do that more simply. But what we are doing here is we are iterating over the data loader. Then we are making the predictions with the model. So we are returning the logits and turning them into class labels here. And then we are counting how often we have a correct class label. And then we divide the number of correct predictions by the total number of examples. This is analogous how we computed the accuracy in previous units. Here we are essentially just using this data loader to iterate over the data set. Now we are working with multi-layer neural networks where data sets can be so large that we can't fit all the data into memory, which is why we are using a data loader. It's just a good practice that we are introducing here. So the next step is then defining the training loop. So what we do is we set a manual seat for reproducibility and then we are initializing our multilayer perceptron. Our data set has two input features and two classes. And we are using the stochastic gradient descent optimizer with a learning rate of 0.05. We are then training the network over 10 epochs. So we are iterating over those 10 epochs. And then we are setting the model into training mode and iterate over the data points or more precisely, the mini batches. The features consists of 32 training examples then, where 32 is our batch size that we defined earlier. The model here makes the predictions, it returns the logits then, the outputs after the last layer. Yeah, and then once we have the predictions, the logits, we can use or define the loss. Here we are using, as we explained earlier, the cross entropy loss. And notice in PyTorch, the cross entropy loss works with the logits the net inputs of the output layer instead of the predicted class membership probabilities. So if you use the binary cross entropy, here you would use the class membership probabilities. However, since we are using the regular cross entropy function, PyTorch expects logits. It will apply the softmax internally. So if I scroll up to our multilayer perceptron implementation, you notice that we are not implementing the softmax here because the cross entropy function does that for us internally. Okay, so and then the further steps are zeroing out the gradients from the previous iteration and performing the backward pass. This is essentially the same thing that we did for the logistic regression and the softmax regression models. There's one more step, optimizer.step, to apply the gradient updates to update the weights. Yeah, and then to see what's going on during training, we will add a little bit of logging here where we are printing out the current epoch, the batch, and then for each epoch, we are also printing out the training accuracy and the validation set accuracy. So let's actually run this. I forgot to run the accuracy function here. Let's run the training loop now. And as we can see, we start with a random performance here. So it's almost a random prediction of 68% accuracy here and the loss slowly goes down, the accuracy improves, and we can see we are reaching already 90% validation accuracy. And at the bottom, yeah, we reach 100% validation accuracy, which is basically perfect. We can see the training accuracy is slightly worse, but this could be due to random effects. We have a very small validation set and a very small training set. So usually it's rare that you find the training set performance B worse than a validation set. Typically it's the opposite due to overfitting, but it appears that the model here is not overfitting, which is nice. However, just to make sure how the model performs on independent test data, let's actually evaluate our model. So by evaluation, we mean here plotting the training accuracy, validation accuracy, and test accuracy, the values. And later on, we will have some additional validation or evaluation lectures where we show some additional aspects like 
evaluating failure cases. But for simplicity, let's just take a look at the accuracy values here. And yeah, we can see that test set accuracy is also pretty good. So our model is not really overfitting here, which is nice. Then lastly, let's also visualize the decision boundary. So we can only do that because we have a two-dimensional data set with two features. In a real world case, you likely have a multi-dimensional data set where this is not possible. So this is some code that might look a little bit intimidating at first. Um, it's actually code that I took from my book and my ML Extend library and simplified it a bit. So it's essentially just pl uh, plotting a grid array of all the data points within a 2D surface. And then it's brute force evaluating the class labels at each possible feature input combination on that 2D surface. So that's something you probably don't need to ever use in practice, and we won't go over the details here, but if you are curious, I can share more information about that in the forum. So let's see how that looks like. And yeah, as you can see, it is learning this nonlinear decision boundary, and it can classify the data points pretty well. There are a few cases like this blue diamond here, or maybe this orange triangle, where it's really hard to learn a function that classifies all the data points, perfectly without overfitting. So in this notebook, we trained a multilayer perceptron on the XOR dataset. We saw that the multilayer perceptron performed actually pretty well. So in the next notebook, we will be looking at a slightly more challenging example, implementing a multilayer perceptron for hand-written digit classification.